All right, before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this last opportunity to speak to my friends, and I just pray for the Holy Spirit to speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I decided to name this presentation, Taste and See, this final mini-sermon, and you will see in a little bit why. Uh, first, let's start with some interesting statistics. So there are currently 2.2 billion Christians in the world. And there is an estimated rough number between 5 to 6 billion in all of Earth's history for about 2,000 years. And in those same 2,000 years, there's also an estimated 70 million Christians who gave their lives for their faith. They were martyrs. And a large amount of that was under fascist and communist movements and during the Dark Ages. So that's pretty amazing. 70 million people is a large amount of people who died for their faith. There's also an estimated, this is really crazy, five to seven billion copies of the Bible that have been produced since its contents were standardized around 1,500 years ago. And around four billion of them were in the last 50 years. As you can see in this graph, it is absolutely killing competition. Sometimes they don't even include it in these charts because it's almost an unfair comparison to the other books. But five to seven billion, pretty big gap, very large number, kind of hard to be precise on it, but that's a lot of Bibles produced. The Bible is also the most persecuted and attacked book in the history of the world. So many different stories that we can talk about that. And yet the Bible has been transforming and has transformed billions of lives every single year and every single century in every corner of the earth. And nevertheless, many people still claim that the Bible is a hoax, that it was conspired for the manipulation of the masses. And all these statistics should make you wonder, did tens of millions of people give their lives for a lie? Were billions of dollars spent to print a lie? Did a man-made lie transform billions of lives for millennia? Why was this book so heavily persecuted and attacked if it was just all a lie? And I've heard someone say, oh, when we go to court, we'll put the hand on the Bible and we'll start to say nothing but the truth. So that's the biggest proof you have that it's not a lie. Obviously, that's, not, that's just kind of interesting. But it should also make you wonder, why do we swear on the Bible if it's all a lie? So all these things should raise question marks. Because spectacular statistics should have spectacular reasons. That's a very logical conclusion. So if this is God's word then did God give us any reason to believe in it? Or are we to have what people call blind faith? And we're going to taste and to see. That's why I named it like this. Taste and see and hopefully understand why the Bible and Christianity has such an impact on the world. And we're going to scratch the surface to see a few principles to really see the remarkability and the reliability of the Bible. So a few quick outline for you. We're going to be covering, scratching the surface, on three testing truths. First one is, did Bible prophecies come to pass? Second one is, was Jesus' successful ministry a hoax? And the third one, is the Bible God-inspired or man-conspired? So tackling the first one, did Bible prophecies come to pass? And we're also going to analyze the Bible claims about it and see if it aligns. That's the goal of this presentation. So the first verse we have is 2 Peter 1, 20-21, and it reads, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible claims that all its prophecies came from God. None of them came from man. So the logical conclusion is they must have some extraordinary fulfillments. They came from God. There must be some evidence to support this. And this is going to be a lightning fast summary of a lot of prophecies that you can study on your own. It will take hours to cover all of this. But I just want to show you some very key prophecies that impact a lot of people. The first one is using symbolism. Daniel chapter 2, 7 and 8 and some other biblical references they accurately prophesied in astounding detail the sequence of governments that would have come to pass, three of them, and that the fourth one would be divided and never again reunited. Now, this is really important because centuries before any of that came to pass, Daniel, through God, prophesied that Babylon was going to be taken over by Medo-Persia, 
Medo-Persia was going to be taken over by Greece. Greece was going to be taken over by Rome. And Rome, in turn, wouldn't be taken over. It would be divided into what we know as modern-day Europe. And despite the efforts of people like Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Napoleon, who all try to reunite Europe, they all failed because of this prophecy. Very amazing. Daniel chapter 7 also accurately prophesied the, the exact length of time that the dark ages will last the exact amount of years of the time that god's people will be largely persecuted that was all prophesied centuries before the dark ages came to pass isaiah 45 this is very interesting prophesied a person who was going to take over babylon by their legal name a hundred years before they were even born isaiah 45 verse 1 to 3 says cyrus and it spells out his name c-y-r-u-s and it's Cyrus the Great, huge historical figure that you can research about. And the Bible prophesied him by his name and what he was going to do a hundred years before he was even born. Then in chapter 9, also accurately prophesied the exact calendar years that Jesus was going to be born, that Jesus was going to be crucified. I'm sorry, that Jesus was going to be baptized, sorry, and die over centuries before he even came to pass. And the book of Revelation is also packed with dozens of other prophecies that would take us years and many months and hours to study. And then to wrap up, the Old Testament includes over 350 prophecies. Not 350, more around 360 something, but over 350 prophecies of Jesus' exact birth, life, and death, and all those circumstances to the utmost precision. And this was so mind-blowing that a mathematics and astronomy professor called Professor Peter Stoner in the College of Pasadena with other 600 students, they made very conservative, cal conservative calculations to arrive at the conclusion that a single man fulfilling just half of all those 360 prophecies, just half, not even all of them, will be theoretically impossible. Now, he uses different measurements and analogies to explain how improbable this is, but it's literally almost impossible. So this is all pretty remarkable. And moving on forward, speaking, you know, about Jesus, what claims does the Bible make regarding his life and his successful ministry? So the second testing truth is, was Jesus' successful ministry a hoax? The Bible claims in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there would be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So from the establishing of Jesus' government, even forever, there would be no end. Now this is a pretty big, bold claim. Because if Christianity and Jesus' government that he established on earth would have crumbled or fallen just even once, this wouldn't have come to pass. So it's also a prophecy. But look at this. Jesus is perhaps one of the most data and research proven historical characters. And even the largest atheist organizations will claim that it is pretty much foolishness to say that Jesus wasn't alive and that they didn't die on the cross. Those are the two things historically that they know for sure happened. And there's a very famous movie called The Case for Christ, as you can see here in the picture, which is based on a book, which is based on a real person called Lee Strobel. And I highly recommend this movie. He was an astounding, starching atheist for his entire life. He was an alcoholic, had problems with his marriage, and he went on a quest to try to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. And he thought he was going to do it in a week, so it's going to be easy peasy. Took him two years to arrive at the conclusion that, wow, there's too much evidence to deny this. Jesus did raise from the dead. He turned a Christian, stopped being an alcoholic, and became a good father and a good husband. Powerful, powerful movie of someone who thought it would be so simple and was completely bombarded with evidence in favor for Christ. And consider this. Jesus wrote no book. He had no status position with the church or the government. He had no formal education. He had little money. He never led an army. And in only three years, think about this, in only three years, years completely changed the world and split time in half how do you do this now a lot of people have done a lot of amazing things and jesus is often listed as the most influential person that has ever lived and his his religion and his government has been remaining 
and has had the legacy as the largest and most influential organization in the history of the world, despite much persecution and trials. So how do you do this in only three years? Absolutely miraculous. Consider the famous trilemma by C.S. Lewis. He says this, Christ was either a conscious deceiver, deluded, or divine. He's either a lunatic, a liar, or Lord. There's no escape in one of these three options. Trilemma, triple L. This is very interesting because we can use some very simple POE, process of elimination. He couldn't be a lunatic, Jesus couldn't be a lunatic, and still have the amount of influence that never die through millennia and also be wiser than all of us combined. I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to appreciate that Jesus was a super remarkable person. And he can't be a lunatic for that reason. He also can't be a liar because why would he lie? To be tortured, beaten, and killed? That's what crazy people do, and we already eliminated that option. And also, liars are generally found out, or they're contradicting themselves at some point. And Jesus hasn't, to this day, for millennia. So therefore, he is either who he claimed to be, or we have no other logical alternative to understand it. And going to our last testing truth, is the Bible God-inspired or man-conspired? And the Bible claims in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for good work. So the Bible claims that all its contents are God-inspired. That's what it's saying. So there must be some supernatural evidence to support this. Same thing with prophecy and not just prophecy. But many people still claim that the Bible is a hoax or it was conspired together to manipulate people. However, there's a lot of evidence that will go against this. And a very interesting one is that the Bible includes many embarrassing details about the disciples and also about Jesus. And why is this a strong evidence? Well, I think all of us here at some point has lied to make yourselves look good. But who lies to make yourselves look bad? That never really happens. Now, if they were trying to write up a legend about Jesus who did all these things that was all a lie, then consider this. The genealogy of Jesus has prostitutes, murderers, and some very shady people. So the, also the disciples, when they're writing about Jesus, they say how his own family thought Jesus was crazy. And his, own, his strongest critics call Jesus a worker of the devil. So imagine, just consider all these things. If they're trying to make this up, imagine if like there was a pharaoh and the scribes are writing about, you know what? Let's talk about this Pharaoh and let's, let's put some prostitutes and some people in his bloodline to, to spice up the bloodline, you know? And we'll make it pretty interesting. We'll make up these stories of how everyone hated him. And I think it will be really cool, right? Over their heads, right? That would never happen. And also consider this. The disciples themselves writing these Gospels. Peter is called the devil by Jesus. Now, there's obviously some context to this. But imagine Mark writing his Gospel saying, hey, Pete. You know what? I want to make this more interesting. I'm going to, call, I'm going to make Jesus call you the devil. Say, like, hold on. Don't, don't pin this on me. Make him call you the devil. Like, I'm not even part of the gospel. So I can't write. You can't make me write. I could make him call Bartholomew the devil. No one talks about Bartholomew. So no. That how, imagine the confusion of that. And also Peter denying Jesus three times after he said he wouldn't. Or, for example, all the disciples running away in fear of the Jews. And who were the brave ones to stay back when Jesus was captive? The woman. Now, obviously, this is, no, this is no attack on women. Many women can be very brave, but there's a specific stereotype that men are supposed to be in the front lines, protecting, strong, and brave, and they're all the ones running away in fear. And on top of that, the women are the ones who were first to see Jesus' tomb empty. Now, why is this a big deal? Because in their time, the woman's witness was not favorable. It was not considered valid. So they're trying to make this up. And they're adding all these weird details that would potentially just make this look bad. It wouldn't make sense, right? Everything they did is literally a, a guide, step-by-step -step plan, selling a course on what not to do if you were write up a legend. Pretty amazing evidence, right? And you also consider things like when Jesus was being crucified. And he's praying for these evil people who when we read about, we just want to smack them. Because they're so evil. And here's Jesus being crucified and tortured. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, the Bible is constantly writing against men's natural reactions and desires. And why would that be? And then even more, the Bible depicts a profound grand theme of God and his love that has all the attributes of God, but also that fulfills our humanity's needs. It's a personal God that runs after man instead of man running after God, unlike any other religious book in the history of the world. 
And if that's not enough, there's a very neat thing called sight, Bible consistency. This is very interesting. Look at this. C stands for cultural. Cultural is, the Bible is a cross-culturally popular book in a way that no other book has ever been. If you consider that, it was written by nomadic Jews and a few other authors. So how do we have Jamaicans, Koreans, and Brazilians knowing who Abraham was? It is the most popular book in the world, right? It has changed billions of lives in every corner of the earth, in every era, and no other book can relate with this. There's also something about this book that transcends time, culture, and place. It is culturally consistent. The I stands for internal, right? The Bible is not one book. It's a compilation of books. It's an encyclopedia. It was written in over 1,600 years by 35 authors on three different continents, right? There's that cultural difference for a total of 66 books covering topics like politics, theology, history, prophecy, health, so much more. So what are the chances of all of that being compiled together and being internally consistent without contradicting itself? Now imagine if you're getting 35 doctors from all over the world to write up a health book on anything. You compile all of those together. How many internal contradictions would that have? A lot. And we don't see that with the Bible. Now this is a very interesting picture right here. This is depicting the 63,000 cross-references that the Bible includes. Now, remember, 1,600 years of production, 35 authors, three different continents. Look how harmonious the scriptures are. This is something that can't be man-made. And obviously, this is a little bit hard to see, and I don't have time to explain this chart. This is what it would look like if it was actually readable and understandable with statistics. This is called the Bible genome. A lot you can take from this. It's pretty amazing. Like, I've took time to deeply analyze this, but I don't have time to explain. I can share with you later as well. But this is how amazing the Bible is, something that only the mind of God could come up with. Very interesting. So the image of God and man is internally consistent throughout the entire Bible, something that editing, manipulation, and conspiration would disrupt. Then we have translational. The Bible is, when the Dead Sea, were, were, the Dead sea Scrolls were found in 1947, Everything changed. Because before, the only manuscripts that we had on the Bible were about a thousand years old. Which meant that the previous a thousand years of Christianity, we had no evidence to know if the Bible had been changed, manipulated it, edited it. So that was a big issue. But when the scrolls were found in 1947, they were dated to be between 100, 200 BC and AD 100. Which literally made it 2,000 years old, a thousand years older than what we had before. And now there was a problem. If they were different from what we had before, it would have been a big issue. But when they were compared side by side, they were found to be 98% identical. With differences being minorities, like prepositional differences. Nothing that would change our theology. Today we have over 6,000 Greek manuscripts only. And when they are compared side by side, they are found to be 98% identical. So this is absolutely incredible evidence, too. And when you compare books like the Iliad by Homer the Poet, which is a famous historical Greek book that decount, uh, depicts the history of uh, deeds of the national hero. When you compare them with the New Testament, for example, the Iliad was written at 900 B.C., so a very, very long time ago, while the New Testament was written in AD 30 to AD 100. So literally almost a thousand years younger so much closer to our time. The age of the oldest manuscript by the Iliad is 400 BC, which literally the first copy we have of the original Iliad came 500 years later. So we have that issue. How do we know that it wasn't changed? While the New Testament, the oldest manuscript we have is 125 AD, which is only 25 years after the last book was written. And the number of manuscript copies of the Iliad, we have around 1,200. Now, a lot of people shoot out different numbers, but in all languages, an estimated 1,200, while the New Testament has 24,000 copies and manuscripts of the New Testament in all languages alone. And yet, books like the Iliad are academically respected and studied, but it was much, much, much less preserved than the Bible. And lastly, we have E for experimental. And perhaps the most compelling evidence is that it impacted my life and the lives of many people around me. So there was once an attempt to arrange a debate between this atheist and this Christian. And the Christian agreed, but he said the conditions were both parties were to bring 50 people who had their lives transformed based on their perspective worldviews. 
So an atheist was to bring 50 people who, after they became an atheist, the alcoholic person stopped being an alcoholic. The abusive parent was going to become a good husband and wife or good parents after they became atheists. And so forth. And the Christian was to do the same thing. And you know what happened? The debate never took place. But even if the atheists were to bring 1, 10, or 50 people that had their lives supposedly changed by atheism, the Christian could bring 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 of people who had their lives transformed by Christ. A lot of people say, well, but how to know it wasn't changed over time or it wasn't manipulated? Well, even besides all this evidence, if God really exists and he really did reveal himself to us through the Bible and through Jesus, he has the power and ability to preserve the very word he inspired. So a lot of people will say the Bible is like a telephone game, right? That the message was lost over time. But if someone goes with the message, it can never be lost. And the Bible is the most impactful thing that I have ever experienced. From personal experience, I can say this. And I decided to give one year of my life to truly know God and his word personally. And I did in core. And you know, I could have gone for literal days on the amount of evidence that this has. And 25 minutes does not do justice for how much we can have reliability and trust in this book. But God truly did relieve and leave much remarkable evidence for us to have full trust in him and his word. And there is no such thing as blind faith with the Bible. So wrapping up what we could discuss here, did Bible prophecies come to pass? Absolutely yes. Was Jesus' successful ministry a hoax? Absolutely not. Is the Bible God-inspired or man-conspired? Absolutely God-inspired. And now we have reasons and answers to those spectacular statistics. Now we know why the church has such an explosive growth after Jesus. Right? These people, the early church and many after them, they didn't give their lives for a lie. They gave their lives because they were truly convicted and transformed on what the Bible and Jesus had done for them. Powerful, right? They look pretty convicted. What do you think? <laughs> so this one year that I decided to learn more about God and his word truly did show me the truth about God's loving character, his amazing salvation plan, and his wonderful promises that we can claim. And if all those things are true, that the Bible truly is reliable, those three things and so much more can also be true in your life. And the thing is, we have to read it. We have to taste it. We have to see it. And that's why I decided to name this presentation Taste and See. And it's from a Bible verse found in Psalm 34, verse 8. And it reads, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. This year I have tasted and I have seen that God and his word truly are good. And I invite you to do the same. Let's pray to close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for leaving such amazing evidence in your word that we can have full trust in you, claim your promises, and have the beautiful image of Jesus that transforms lives. And I pray that this message may impact someone listening here and on someone who may be listening online, that they may have trust in you to read and dissect your word to see how many wonderful things you have in store for them. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.